Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the next session of the Probabilistic Machine Learning Reading Group. Um, tonight, we're going to be covering neural nets for images. And uh, Anturi Jana, who's already presented, uh, will be presenting. And uh, I guess we can uh, we can get started whenever you want, Anturi. You should be able to share your screen. Yeah, sure. Uh, just, just give me a minute. I'll be okay. present. Okay, no problem. And in the meanwhile, if you have any questions, please drop that in the chat section. I'll be right back in a minute. Okay. Just doing some settings. Yeah. I think. Uh... Someone had a comment? I think the speaker is having connection issues. So we'll just uh, wait a couple of minutes. Hmm. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. And we're just about to get started. Thanks a lot for Mr. Perry to take the word of organizing the presentations. So today's topic is something you must have seen before or done before, those kind of things, but pretty interesting. Uh, just a second, just a second, just a second. Yep. Let me share my screen. And we begin. Good. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Neural Network for Images. And today's session, we'll be talking about how is image processing revolution? How did neural networks revolutionize the industry or the domain of computer vision with the help of, I mean, with entirely revolutionized the conceptual or classical image processing things which used to happen with OpenCV and now we are using neural networks. So that's, that's the topic of discussion, that's the center of discussion for today. So let's first understand what images are. So you have a bunch of images we deal with binary image popularly there are a lot of formats a lot of different formats but we deal with a lot of different different formats we have binary image we have grayscale image we have rgb we have infrared image so what's a binary image binary image is one wherein you have each pixel is allotted either as value of zero or one wherein zero means black one means white and the resulting image would be completely black or white image, complete black and white image. Now what we generally call as black and white image is usually a grayscale image. So first, how, how that discussion would be, let me give you a brief overview of what the discussion shall be for today's session. First, we'll understand and try to understand what images are in terms of computer. In the world of computers, what images are, we'll try to understand that. Once we get through it, we'll start with what a neuron is, what a neural network is, then what our entire neural network is, then what a deep convolution neural network looks like, understand the various parts of deep convolution neural network, some relevant questions which are usually asked, popular data sets, why these are popular, when to use it, why to use it, 
we uh, the speciality of all the architectures then we'll talk about the entire computer vision domain on a very superficial way what is attention mechanism and how is it used in inference what are transformers how why have why are they gaining popularity in the world of computer vision and how can you combine computer vision with nlp then we talk about the failure cases of computer vision i forgot to add few images but i can show those ones all right so those of you who are new to the session of first time attending hi i'm i'm antorip jana i'm not introducing myself again i'm antorip jana i have been into computer vision nlp lot of those things and yeah so if you want to ask or reach out for something please feel free to do so let's begin with the topic our today's topic is understanding images and uh, so first we start with images what are images images something with there are multiple types of images there are hsv there's lav format there's uh ycv something something so those are various formats of images but the ones which are popularly used in machine learning or in deep learning training training of the models or in neural networks are these ones so hsv or lab these are the ones which are used in open cv so we are not dealing with those ones usually these are used in open cv methods but ones which are used for deep learning are binary grayscale usually grayscale and rgb but sometimes you might have to deal with ir and binary so what is a binary i just talked about what is a binary your pixel value can be a zero value or can be a one so if it is a zero value it's black if it is one it's white and that's a binary image completely black and white now this is a grayscale image this is a grayscale image this is a grayscale image and grayscale has a speciality that you assign a number of bits so let's say here we have 255 bits so one typical question which is usually asked how do you calculate the image size using bits i have a youtube a uh, video on this please check out my channel there is a problem which i have discussed on my youtube channel how to calculate the size of image using the bits let's say this is a 28 bit image how do you calculate the size of image i won't discuss it here because it would deviate from the main topic of the course of discussion so we are not going to discuss that but please check out the youtube channel so let's say 8 bit image 8 bit image means 2 to the power 8 options Two to the power eight option. That means two fifty six values, starting from zero. So that's why zero to two fifty five. So now you have zero as the darkest, and two fifty five would be the brightest, as it happened over here. So we had only two values, zero and one. Where zero was darkest, it was the brightest. Right. Now let's say I want to. expand this entire horizon then i have this gray scale thing you have this darkest and the brightest and all in between the intermediate values so the larger the range is larger the bit size is the more detailed your image would be so let's say this one was with 4 bits then you can say yes this one is with 8 bits because this is way more detailed detailed with the intensity of the color so what are we detail what are we concerned or what is varying over here it's not the color is the intensity of the color is the intensity of the color which is being altered or which is being varied across then you have rgb images rgb is something you must have heard about is a combination of red green blue this is what happens now let's talk about the practical things you have image libraries known as pil in pil you would always do something like from pil import image so when you do image dot open and the file name so it is always in the uh, in the mode of bgr so when you load a image file if you want if you load an image file let's say this is an image you load it using pil library it would be in bg uh, format you would have to convert it into rgb if you load it using open cv cv2 or yeah you using cv2 or sk image it would be in rgb format 
So there are a bunch of transformations you need to do using PIL image, but usually PIL image is a bit more comfortable for loading images as well as converting them. So usually people prefer PIL image rather than CV2. And yeah, it's a bit more stable and conversion friendly. So this is this is what people usually love to do. But you can do, do it either ways. You can do CV2, you can do PIL, anything. So this is a practical part which you would be concerned with. If you want to slice out an index, so you might be asked to slice out an index. So that is something like, let's say you have an image array. Now this image has three dimensions. Assume this is an image array. You want to slice out the red index. So you, what do you, why is it doing like this? Uh, how do I do this? So let's say you have an image array. So we have three dimensions, right? Now we are dealing with a channel dimension. First dimension are, are for rows, columns, and third one is for the channels. Now, since I want all the rows and all the columns of red, and I would do zero indexing. If I want for green, I would do index one. I think you got the point. These are the things which are usually asked. Let's say you want to manipulate one particular index. Let's say you want to manipulate for green. You're performing a transformation. So what you're going to do is you select this. Let's say you want to nullify for all the, all the values for green, you could do zero. Then all the values in green would be zeroed. And that would be a new image. I hope you got the point. Now let's go to grayscale and IR image, understanding the difference between grayscale image and IR image. And this is a very interesting topic. So grayscale image doesn't capture the heat of the frame under consideration. So what's an IR image? IR image is infrared image. So infrared images are those which are usually used for military and, and if you're using it for personal military or airports, else is prohibited and strictly prohibited. I mean, there are uh, invasive privacy policies. I mean, infrared cameras are not allowed. If somebody does, it's very criminally offensive act. So we have infrared image and then we have grayscale image. Grayscale image is easily accessible on your local devices, uh, your cameras or those. So you can obtain a grayscale image, but infrared images are not accessible to the common public because of invasive nature of privacy. That's why. But how do you distinguish a grayscale image and infrared image? Infrared image captures the heat of the object. So it captures the heat of the object. So if it captures the heat of the object, so the, any particular object might be cold at one point of time and might be hot at one other, other, other instance. So it's cold at one point, it would not be radiating heat and thereby anything which radiates heat is captured by infrared image as white, super bright, so white. And if it does not em emit heat, heat, it would be a dull blackish color. So whereas a grayscale image would definitely remain constant. I mean, it remains constant over the time. It does not capture heat. So that's why it would, whatever the grayscale image at one instance is, it's always the grayscale image at any instance. Whereas IR image, if the object was hot at that particular time, it would have been a super wide image. And if, if it had been cold at, at the other instance, it would be very dull and black image. Added to it, IR image also depends on the camera type you're using to capture the image. So that's why there's a huge difference between grayscale image and IR image. And that's why, I mean, we need to understand that very well. And IR image is usually a concern for those people who are dealing with the satellites or in the military. And it's not usually generally approved or, I mean, it's very, very strict prohibitions as well as uh, laws, laws protecting the uses of infrared for common public. Now let's start with neural nets. So we have neural nets. This is a very, very starting point neuron, the neuron cell, which is an in, um, a mimicry of the mimicry of the human brain cell neuron. So what is it? 
So you have a bunch of inputs and your one output cell, a bunch of inputs go get along with the weight, weight, same weight matrix, multiply the product, the bunch of inputs, the product of weight matrix, input product of weight matrix, input product of weight matrix, sum it out or whatever the operation you want to do, final obtain out the output. If you want to add anything, add any, any, any particular operation, let's say you want to do square root and that would be your final output. So this is what a neuron does. So very, very simple question would be, let's say you have a neuron and I am giving input as one, two, three, my weight matrix are one, zero, minus one. And here I'm using identity function, fx equals to x, then what would be my output? Let's say I have a bias term as well. I have a bias equal to one. So one into one plus two into zero plus three into minus one, that is one minus three, that is minus two plus one, that is from bias. So minus two identity function, output is minus two. Let's say it is square root, then square root of minus two, an imaginary number, right? All right, let's proceed. Now let's start with neural networks. What are neural networks? Neural networks are basically a bunch of neurons interconnected with each other. A single neuron is something you will find in an amoeba. This is something you will find in low-level microorganisms. Bunch of neurons interconnected. Not human. Humans is very, very extremely vast. So it's not human-like, but it's like a small-level microorganism. So what is it is trying to, we are slowly and gradually developing upon the architecture, making complex bit by bit. Now this is a single neuron, single neuron connects to another neuron, single neuron connects to another neuron, multiple connections. Then based on such connections, uh, same fundamental law, we are obtaining the final output. Since this is very small, we call it shallow networks. And what is it? So this, these are the input layers. These are the output layers. And here we have hidden layers. I'm not touching upon the topic of back propagation. That is back propagation gradient descent. That is there on my YouTube channel. If you want to understand, you can definitely go to my YouTube channel, learn a bit about it. And you'll have a better understanding as those topics are a bit heavy and time consuming. And I mean, we do, we definitely have a shortage of time. I have around 40 minutes left to cover everything. So this is this is this is where the main thing happens. This is the main thing happens. So these are the ones, these are the layers, what we call as the ones which capture low level features. These are the layers which capture the low level features. These are the layers which capture the final level features. We'll get to it. Now let, let, let's talk about the topic of the day. Deep convolutional networks or deep neural networks. So within, let's say what I was talking about, the starting layers are always the ones. So you have an image, right? You have an image. The image has various parts. It has uh, edges, edges, round edges, corners, multiple small level parts. So those are known as an image on a very intuitive level is made of, of three types of features, what we call as low level features, mid level features, and high level features. So what are the low level features? Low level features are edges and those kind of things. What are, what are mid level features? Mid level feature, let's say you're discussing about a face, let's say human face. What would be a low level features? The edges, the the edges, basically edges, the round corners or the tips, those kind of things. Now, if you combine a bunch of edges, you might end up making an eye or you might end up making a tongue, you might end up making lips, you might end up making a jaw, anything. So those would be mid-level features of the image, of the, of the image. Bunch of low-level images combined in a random permutation combination might make sense, might not make sense but usually makes sense once the model is training. So this is a self-learning thing happens and we generate the mid-level features.
All right, thank you. And then we have high level features. So high level features of an image are the ones which are practically dealing with the images you are seeing at hand. So high level features. So these, the initial layers, initial layers are the ones which have the low level features of the image in general. So it might be edges, edges, points, those kind of things. Then we have mid-level features. Mid-level features are the ones which are random permutation and combination of the low-level features resulting in nose, eyes, teeth, ears, anything. And then high-level features would be different possible faces. Assuming we are not dealing with digits, we are dealing with face data set, right? So what would be in the case of digits? Digits would be, let's say, edges, corners. So low-level features usually remain the same for all the data sets. That is why in transfer learning, what we do, we usually cut off the final layers and keep the initial layers as it is and add new final layers and keep the model training happening from for the final layers. But we'll talk, talk about that at the later stage. So for this particular image, what would it be? What would it be? It would be like the low level features would be the edges, the corners and those kind of things. Then we have mid level features, bunch of edges combining to, for a round something like this, something like this would be mid-level features. And high-level features would be two, three, something similar to two, three, possible two, threes, like not exactly two, three, but something seeming like two, three. So this is what happens inside a neural network while model is training. So what we call this as a feature map, as a feature map, traditionally, we could have had all single, 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 single neurons. But this was not scalable. Everything uh, learned this by heart from a very personal experience, not written anywhere. Neural networks is all about how well are you able to scale it to make it uh, seemingly human. Are you able to scale it to make it seemingly human? No, this does not happen, right? This is this is very 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 feasible for very um, a bunch of hundred, five hundred, thousand neurons but when you try to exceed that your model tries to de start to deteriorate and you don't want a model to deteriorate so what you do you start into you we started introducing convolution neural nets so this is the this is the very essence of this is the essence and heart and soul of our neural networks that we need to have uh, something that we are able to scale it out and to bigger and bigger and bigger data sets and bigger and bigger uh, use cases so we had convolution neural nets convolution neural nets added the ability on top of the simple neurons that we can exceed it and make it happen for way bigger data sets and way bigger computational powers and those kind of things with much better accuracy. So let's understand convolution nets. The first very thing which you should understand a convolution net is a convolution. So first, the things which you have taken into consideration till now is understanding image. We have understood image, now image, can go into various types of images. Now, why, why did we, very first thing, I should have started talking about this at the very beginning, but I skipped it out. What is a neural net? Why, why, why neural net for images? Because software development fails over here. We cannot define that if the image is round, then it is two. If this happens, then it would be three. If this happens, then it would be four. This is extremely complex and difficult and the code code happening, code, this can be done, but the code base for such kind of programs is usually extremely lengthy. So it was not feasible if the number of classes was exceeding 10, 12, 15. If the number of classes is 1000, as in the image net, or 10,000, impossible. So what is a better way to do? Make a generic program, which is self-learning, and we call it as neural net. That's the hype. So hype of neural net is nothing but a pro program which is self-learning, self. What is a neural net? I think we discussed it. I discussed it in one of my YouTube videos. These are nothing but bunch of matrices. Matrices with weights and something WX plus B. Self-adjusting matrices which are being constantly multiplied with each other with some weights and bias, lots and lots of matrices arranged together, which keep on adjusting their weights in such a manner that the entire, uh, that whatever the input is, a corresponding output is generated. These self-adjusting matrices 
are known as neural nets and they do not work on the conventional software development fundamentals so let's start about let's talk about convolution nets what are convolution nets within convolution nets the first and foremost topic is understanding convolution so you have an image this is my image convolution is pretty similar to filters the only difference is filter was a generic filter let's say you have a uh, you have a, a low any any gaussian filter laplace filter those those kind of filter let's say one of the most popular filter is median filter or any let's say this this filter you apply 0 1 to 1 0 0 1 to 1 minus 1 to 1 or whatever it is to find the edges right so th this is a filter which will just find out edges so you're defining what to do now what convolution nets does it does not we do not define filters it automatically finds filters using these kernels with some random values it goes through makes with the self adjusting values of those kernels it goes through the entire images adjusts the kernels gives outputs and that, that is how it happens so this is the difference we know that we are looking for an edge detection filter here we don't know what we are looking for this is what the self-adjusting matrix does. It defines a kernel, images something we already have, and a bunch of such filters happen. Let's say you define uh, hair as 32, 32 filters. I need for the hair, I need low-level filters, 32 filters. So 32 randomly initialized matrices would be generated. Of the size you wish to make, 32 such filters would be generated. Now 32 filters are generated these 32 kernels would try to extract out information based on their position in the entire net. So since these are at the low level features and directly dealing with the image, these would extract out the low level or the edges, usually edges, corners, points, those kind of things from the image. Now these filters, these filters are being fed the extracted out images. So this would be something like edges or corners. So if the image at concern is not the original image is extracted out corner and those kind of things, it would try a filter would try out try to figure out something else, which is beyond the human comprehension. So this is how a convolution works. Now you have a convolution kernel. Kernel would go through the entire image. Let's say this is the corner. You know how the filters work. Just it goes through the end those the one through the part which is it being overlapped with, does the matrix operations. And you finally get the output by summing or whatever the appropriate operation is. Now, in convolution, you have another operation which is known as padding and striding. Usually asked to, on a very superficial level, usually, um, I mean, you should know what exactly padding is. So what padding is, padding is something like uh, usually used. Where does it do, do we use? So there are two types of padding. You have valid and same. So valid does not ensure that the size of the output image after the convolution. So convolution is something which is summarizing in nature, right? It is summarizing in nature. Whatever is happening over these cells would be represented by a single pixel. What happened? Okay. So is summarizing in nature, right? You have convolution, a kernel is summarizing in nature. It takes the entire 3 cross 3, 4 cross 4, 5 cross 5, goes through it and represents it by a very single value, but just a single value. So it is a summary, summary, summarizing in nature. So if it is summarizing in nature, so what does padding do? Padding, so if you, let's say you don't want it to shrink, you want it to be the same size, then padding might help. Stride is for so you have same, same is for ensuring it is for the same and valid is for ensuring that the operation remains valid. Stride is for the jump you want to have. So if you want to skip over, you don't want to go one by one, you want to go two by two, stride is there to help you out. So if you don't want to go, let's say, this particular box first, then this one, rather, 
rather 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 you want this and then this so this is where stride would help you out a jump of two this is a very famous uh, popular formula so i think very intuitive by now how do you understand the output dimension how would you calculate that this is the output dimension for a six cross six input uh, when convoluted against a two cross two kernel with stride two and padding one so two cross two kernel right stride is divisive in nature so definitely would come over here so let's say you did not have padding and you did not have stride you just have the input image the kernel then what would be the output input image and the kernel then simply it goes through it one by one one by one one by one this minus this would fetch you four cross four and plus one i mean it is very intuitive this very particular part now if you have padding padding increases the dimension by two on the both sides so that's why two play and stride is divisive in nature you're jumping if you're jumping you are divisive by nature and that is why by s so this is how you can remember the formula but don't try to derive the formula at the point where you are being asked so this is an empirical formula which is by experimentation and no such mathematical proof so a modern neural network deals with many such layers which we would like to discuss one such layer is dense layer so dense layer is the one which we talk about as the single neurons so combination of single neurons is dense layer so i think you already know about dense layer and you have a good understanding of dense layer so usually we never start with dense layer we start with convolution 2d bunch of convolution 2d then we flatten it out and once we flatten it out we send it to dense layer any questions till now we are halfway through the session please ask if you have anything to ask next is max pooling layer max pooling helps you out to so you have max pool, basically pooling layers not max pooling pooling layers so you have two types of pooling layers one is average pooling and then we have max pooling so usually applied after convolution layers one convolution or two convolution layers so you have convolution 2d uh you can add max you can add a pool layer or you can have two convolution two convolutions and then you can have pool any any anything so what is average pooling a kernel is there it would average it out the kernel would average it out from whatever it goes through what was how is it different from your traditional traditional this particular convolution kernel it is a multiplicative operation where the weights are learnable so this is self adjusting matrix which where the learning happens here nothing is learned here nothing is learned no matter what the operation is it would just go through the take a averaging kernel go through the particular unit average it out and generate an output particular cell so there is no learning happens over here. this is an pooling is that is why it's not learning layer flatten is does not happen any learning it just takes the convolution two dimensional layers so it is a convolution two dimensional it would flatten it out let's say into 4096 into a traditional neural network so here it was bunch of layers bunch of layers now what we have over here is a flattened out layer another layer which is pretty interesting is batch normalization i have an extensive talk about batch normalization 
on my YouTube channel. Please check it out. Pretty interesting, but a bit complicated for the session. And given the given the time constraint we have, but do check it out. It's worthwhile discussing. Some relevant questions and problems which are usually asked in the modern day questions is calculating the output shape and calculating the total number of parameters of a layer. So just a second. Keras mm. model summary. So if you try to print out the model summary, this is something you would observe. So here we have output shape, parameters, output shape, parameters, total parameters, trainable parameters, non-trainable parameters. How do we get it? It's something I would ask you to check out again, check out my YouTube channel. There, these are discussed on a very, very detailed manner so please check it out but these are questions which are frequently asked i think i do have a tutorial on this check it out over then just search output shape calculating output shape and number of parameters this is weekly session 26 check it out this is pretty interesting Now let us start and continue. So just check, check these two questions. Then that's the point I wanted to stress on. Some popular data sets in computer vision or images, CIFAR 10, image MNIST, fashion MNIST, these are toy data sets. Then you have proper data sets as ImageNet and MS Coco. MS Coco is for image classification as well as for localization. ImageNet is for classification, usually classification. Then you have open images by Google, open images data set. And yep. So let's discuss the architectures one by one. We have AlexNet. AlexNet is simple architecture of a bunch of dense networks connected together. Then you have VGG. VGG is convolution nets were introduced and we had VGG. Again, if you want to have a detailed understanding, visit my YouTube channel. Resonates, but VGG such, let's say you want to stack up such convolution 2D, 2D, 2D. Again, the point of scalability and the ability to mimic the human brain was being hampered. So what we have is if we keep on adding 50 such convolution 2D networks, the performance of the model deteriorates. Then what we did is we have the vanishing gradients and exploding gradients. So let's say we have gradients thing. So it is calculating low level features. Basically it is summarizing effect of convolution networks is some bit hampering in nature. It is summarizing, it is summarizing. Let's say at the layer number 40, there's nothing being sent over here or the update which is being made. So how does the update happen? You know about backpropagation, right? So update being made is very trivial over here. The weights are being lost. So to prevent that, we had resonance which allowed the skip connections to happen. So the weights over here are being resupplied to weights to a layer at a future point. Then we had dense nets. Dense nets were the ones which did interconnections to all the layers. Fnets, Fnets try to mimic the width, length and breadth of the scalability factor. Inception nets, just, just, just go through the YouTube channel. I mean, very detailed discussion on these, but these are the ones which are listed out on Keras applications. These are a bunch of popular paper papers or the architectures which are being used widely in the industry for classification. Now let's talk about various domains of neural nets in image domain. So this is basically entire computer vision. So if you want to have a mastery over computer vision, this is what you need to understand. You need to be good at classification. You need to be good at object localization and detection, image recognition. So what is classification? You have an image. 
of a cat. You want to tell whether or not it is a cat or dog. So this is classification. Now I want to know where in this image is the cat. This is localization or detection. Image recognition or verification. This is basically for banking and signature purposes. Let's say what is segmentation. I don't want the box. Rather, I just want it to be extracted out. So this is this is me and the background being shaded out. This is the segmentation happening. So you can see a part of me being extracted or being highlighted out. This is segmentation. Then you have generative models. So based, let's say you have a data set. Based on the data set, you want to generate similar data. Then you have generative models. You have uh, low, low resolution images, high resolution images. Then you have super resolution. You have zero shot and few shot learning. These are a bit hot these days. These are the techniques to enable you to learn and train your model with very few data. So these are zero short, few short learning, pretty, pretty interesting. Now what is attention mechanism in images usually used for inferencing? Now, if you want to inference your image or your model, you would need to have an attention mechanism. So you have this CAM method, you have gradients method, you have grad CAM method. In the CAM method, it allows more or less, they are trying to figure out what the model is, which part of the image is the model paying attention to, to figure out that this was the one, this was the reason I classified it as bird or which particular species of bird. So these are bit some of methods. Grad CAM is a combination of CAM and gradients. So gradients are a bunch of methods. So these, I mean, the neural network for images is extremely vast. What I'm trying to do is give you a very brief overview of what neural networks for images is. Now, based on this very architectural overview, what you can do is you can dive deeper into these topics because these are topics which will take their own invest time investment and study. So I don't want to get into it. Just my whole idea of the session is to get you familiar with the topics which are there in computer vision. So let's say you want to declare yourself as a computer vision engineer, then these are the topics you should be extremely familiar and good with, good at. These are some modern day topics which talk about transformers for images. So transformers were very popular for the NLP and this particular paper also gained a lot of inspiration from NLP papers. So what we have in NLP papers like words are being made into embeddings. So rather than words, uh, the image is being made into embeddings by converting into patches. Now there have been a lot of work around patches. How the patches are being dealt with is what makes a paper special. So what they are trying to do is leading the patches into linearly flattened projections and embeddings, then passing them out to the transformer encoder and multi-head tension. And this is something which is very common to the one which we saw in the NLP part. So this is the paper of 2019, gained extreme popularity, vision transformers. Then is a context wherein we are trying or an application where we are trying to amalgate and concatenate images with text. So let's say this is an image which is being passed to our CNN network. The output is a vector, feature vector. So I have skipped upon many things. Do, do you understand what this is, feature vector? So what is a neural network? You pass in the image, you have a neural network. Neural network is doing a classification. The classification net is usually some probability value, let's say 0 0.001, 0 0.002, the highest probability value, let's say 0 0.8. I'll find, a, find out its index. Out of the 10 indices, let's say out of 10 indices, it was index number seven. Now I'll find out what index number seven is. Index number seven is for giraffe. So this is how I figured out the images for giraffe. 
Now this is a classification head. So what did we have over here? We have convolutions here. Then as I told, convolution, max pooling, those kind of things. So feature learning. After you're done with feature learning is the part where classification happens. So we flatten it out. Once you flatten it out, you have a 4096 or 2048, something like that, a very long array or dense vector. Now you want to have a classification head, but you cannot directly, it's not advisable to directly have a, let's say you have 10 classes, it's not directly advisable to have a dense layer of 10 different, uh, dense layer of 10 units. So what we do is make dense units of 256, 512, 512, 256, and finally arrive over here. So once you are doing that, rather than a classification, you make a flatten, you flatten it out, you do a 512, then you make it of 256. These are feature vectors. So feature vectors are then being passed to the LSTMs and LSTMs is a concept of NLP. So these feature vectors, usually numeric in format, are being passed to the LSTMs, which have this text data as a labeled data. So these are trying to understand that if an image which goes through a trained convolution network will always generate a typical kind of feature vector. And based on that feature vector, the LSTM would predict what the image caption would be. If you don't understand, don't worry. Failure of AI in computer vision. So let's say this is an apple, right? But if you put a label over it, iPod, this would be classified as iPod. Another very similar example is a dog face and a muffin cake. So such, such, uh, such instances are commonly uh, considered as failure images. All right. Any questions till now? I think we did cover and skip. We did skip over a lot, but we, I tried not to get into the nitty gritties of the session because neural network for images, I mean, neural network for computer vision, if Mr. Perry allows, this entire topic is usually five to six lectures. So I did not want to um, uh, intimidate you with those kind of things, but just wanted to give you a very superficial overview. If you want to reach me out, this is my last session for this particular book reading thing, but I'm there for you. If you want to reach me out, email, LinkedIn, Twitter, feel free to reach out. Any questions? If any questions, please turn your mic on and Yeah. Any questions? Does anybody have any, any questions for uh, entering? I know this session was not extremely descriptive, but I just wanted to give a very brief overview. And please do check out the slides and try to take, uh, I mean, pick one slide, see the topics being discussed and try to get deep into it. I mean, that's the idea. This was a very overview. And the ones I just tried to pick up the topics which are extremely discussed and talked about. Because one hour is not sufficient for this particular topic, but I tried to cover out all the things. I think you did a great job. You gave us a really good overview. And like you said, this is a chapter that you could write a, an entire book on. I mean, it's an entire field yeah. of, of AI days, computer vision. Um, thank you very much, Entry, for the presentation. And um, I guess if there's no questions, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, and we'll see everybody. Um, Next week, hopefully, um, I just got an email from the next week's presenter that he won't be able to present. So I need to find a presenter for next week. Um, I sent an email out to all the presenters. Hopefully, somebody will volunteer to present the 
the next week's uh, chapter on uh, neural nets for sequences. Um, uh, what is it? What's the topic? Neural nets for sequences. For sequences for NLP. Yeah, for NLP, basically. Yeah. Okay, let let me check uh, check my session uh, schedule and I'll get back to you if possible. Okay. I can take the yeah. Okay, that'd be great. You'll 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 um you'll, when you check your email, you'll see an email from me. Um, I sent it to all the presenters um, to see if someone wanted to to volunteer. But if you're yeah, willing yeah. to do it, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks again, Andrew, for taking the time to prepare this and presenting. And um, I guess yeah, we'll, we'll we'll wrap it up and um. Hopefully see everybody here uh, next week. All right. Have uh, have a good night, folks. Please. Yeah, bye-bye.